Welcome to Education Matters presented by the Public School Forum of North Carolina. I'm your host, Tom Williams. In an era when our ability to collect data is better than ever, policymakers believe that to improve our students' academic success, we must leverage that data in new and innovative ways. So how do we get there? State educational leaders believe we must develop a robust system, longitudinal data system that connects student information from across the educational continuum. And we must develop local data profiles that can help leaders better prepare the next generation for college and careers. Today we'll hear from experts and leaders who are doing great work to contribute to these efforts, which will ultimately ensure that all North Carolinians achieve the academic success they deserve. Before we tackle our main topics, we open with headlines, our quick scan of education headlines across North Carolina and the U.S. The candidate field for the next state superintendent of public instruction got smaller Tuesday night. UNC Greensboro professor and former elementary school teacher Dr. Jennifer Mangrum won the Democratic primary with 33 percent of the vote, beating four other candidates. Former education advisor to Pat McCrory and current chancellor of Western Governors University Catherine Truitt won the Republican vote beating Representative Craig Horn with 53% of the vote. Current State Superintendent Mark Johnson lost his bid for Lieutenant Governor in this week's primary election. School districts are preparing for the spread of the corona, coronavirus as North Carolinians learned the first case of the virus had been reported in Wake County. President Donald Trump told schools to be on alert and State Superintendent Mark Johnson is recommending schools and families prepare as they would for the flu by cleaning classroom objects and having hand sanitizers in classrooms. State health officials directed school leaders to maintain their cleaning procedures in schools and said that they are not in a state of emergency but are making contingency plans should the situation escalate there is discussion surrounding the prospect of closing schools to help block the spread of the coronavirus. There has been no word of when, if, or how school closing could or would need to take place. An international exam given to teenagers from 79 countries has ranked the U.S. ninth in reading, but ranked our country 31st in math literacy. This draws the question of why American students are struggling in math some of the differences between how the U.S. teaches math and how some of the top performing countries teach math involves a difference in focus. In the U.S., high school math focuses on formulas and procedures rather than solving complex problems. Math experts recommend integrating algebra, geometry, probability, and statistics rather than teaching them separately, allowing students to take deeper dives into complex problems and relate to them more. Remember, you can visit the Public School Forum's website at ncforum.org, click Education Matters, and read more about each of the headlines as well as other topics we cover each week. I'd like to welcome to the show Allison Goff, Policy Analyst at the Hunt Institute, and Jeff Coltrane, Senior Education Advisor in the Office of Governor Roy Cooper. Thank you both for joining us today. Thank you for having, us. for having us. Mr. Coltrane, let's open up. While data is not anything new in what we've been trying to do across North Carolina, the state's really been trying to advance uh, a statewide longitudinal data system for education and workforce development. If you can, give us some background on the current progress in advancing this data system. Sure. So North Carolina has a long history of uh, education data and, and of working on a longitudinal data system. And it goes all the way back to the mid-1990s when um, the state required um, our workforce development system to set up what's called the common follow-up system, um, which is actually a, a, a merger between uh, education data and then wage outcome data provided by our Department of Commerce. Um, and so that was sort of our first foray into longitudinal data. And then um, back in the mid-2000s, the state received two um, federal grants to begin working on um, what's now called NC Schoolworks, which is actually um, the, the, um, the system that connects our uh, early childhood, our K-12, our higher education, and our workforce data together um, to, um, uh, to help us uh, make better decisions. And through that process to develop NC Schoolworks, we actually developed probably one of the core aspects of our longitudinal data system, which is our unique identifier. Um, so now every K-12 student in our state has um, a single identifier, no matter what district they're in, what school they're in. Um, that also carries forward to our higher education system and actually back into our early childhood system if a student starts there. Um, and then the third system that uh, is a part of our longitudinal data system here in North Carolina is our Early Childhood Integrated Data System, or ESIDS, and it's actually housed within our Department of Health and Human Services. 
Um, and that system actually combines um, early childhood education data, um, social uh, well-being data, and health data for our, um, our youngest uh, residents, uh, birth to age five. Mm -hmm. um, so those three systems together, um, we envision as a system of systems that actually are providing longitudinal data um, for our education continuum. Great. So Ms. Goff, recently the Hunt Institute um, produced a, a report um, connecting the continuum to look at uh, profiling the state's efforts around building this robust system. What did you all find and what do you see as some of the key characteristics of what a really robust state longitudinal data system would look like? Yeah. So at the Hunt Institute, we work across the country with policymakers to increase their capacity to really lead on education, to make informed decisions. And in those conversations, we hear a lot of frustration about lack of data, not knowing why some states have data that other states don't have. So in taking a closer look at North Carolina's system, we were really excited to see such a strong history of data, as Jeff mentioned. And um, we're really happy to see so many partners at the table from the various agencies who are willing to work together to build this longitudinal data system. We studied North Carolina's system and also looked at other states and found that there were a couple of factors that tended to always exist when we found a high quality system. Policymaker support is really important. We know that we need legislators who are willing to support systems through funding and staffing. We also found that meaningful collaboration from agencies, trust among those partners was critical. High quality governance, so what are the rules that govern the system and what is the body that oversees that group? Um, and finally, a robust privacy and security system. We know that for parents and families, that's really important, and for agencies as well to be sure they're meeting federal data mandates and how they're using and sharing data. Right. So Mr. Coltrane, we know how critical executive leadership is. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about the governor's charge and uh, for the state's effort to move forward this longitudinal data system, and how are you all trying to go about it? So in 2017, uh, Governor Cooper charged the Education Cabinet, which are the heads of the state's education agencies, plus the Secretary of Health and Human Services and the Secretary of Commerce, um, to focus on three key areas of, of importance to our education systems. One was teacher recruitment and retention. The second was post-secondary attainment. And the third was data sharing. And this was actually an issue that had been identified across uh, the education sectors as one that they wanted to really focus on. And so through some further conversations with um, staff and the leadership at the cabinet agencies, we realized that the way to really improve data sharing was to strengthen our education longitudinal data system. So uh, in collaboration with the cabinet and with the Government Data and Analytics Center, or GDAC, which is in our department of, um, the state's Department of Information Technology, um, we've been uh, working on a study to look at how can we better connect those three systems that I mentioned, um, how can we um, uh, help to modernize those systems so that we can get better data, and then what do we need to do to be able to analyze that data to move us forward um, with more information. And, um, and so as a, also as a part of that, the Cabinet also um, decided to undertake a pilot research study to say, let's get some data out of the system and actually look at some outcomes. And so, Education matters. Um, as is part brought of that, to we looked at um, uh, the, we tracked three graduate cohorts from um, high school uh, from uh, some previous years and then looked to see where did they go in their first two years following high school. And it's quite interesting to sort of see those pathways. We have a lot of students that sort of migrate between community college and higher ed that are obviously working and um, in higher education. And then a fair number of students um, uh, that actually never graduated from high school but show up um, in our higher education system, either our universities or community colleges, and are completing degrees and credentials. Very good. I'm going to come back to you, Ms. Goff, and then maybe let Mr. Coltrane uh, add any additional thoughts to this. And so we, a lot of times we talk about what's our why. Mm -hmm. So what's the why of the importance of doing this and um, how are, does the Hunt Institute see that? Great. It's such an important question. And, um, you know, it's very easy for data to remain siloed. Mm -hmm. It's very easy for one agency mm -hmm. to keep data where it is. But if we think about North Carolina, for example, if we have a student enrolled in North Carolina pre-K, that data lives at Health and Human Services. Mm -hmm. But we really need to know when they get to kindergarten if they came to kindergarten prepared. But those data are at DPI. So how do we connect those data? This also works in the reverse. Community colleges have a lot of data on their students. Is that data being fed back to the K-12 sector to talk about how well our current course of study is preparing students? 
Um, it's also really important to think about how we look closely at data and break it down by sub subgroups to think about equity. How do we ensure that we're serving each child in North Carolina with a high quality education? We really need to look at where some of those equity gaps may lie, and if we're not using longitudinal data, we may not be able to see where those are. One thing we've been working on at the Hunt Institute with the governor's office and also with GDAC is a group we're calling the Informed Decision Making Collaborative. This is a group of policy leads from across agencies who are working to create a research agenda that will guide our state longitudinal data system with the goal being, what are the questions? What is the why for North Carolina system? How can we be sure we're serving each and every one of our students? Good. So I'm gonna come back uh, in our last minute or so here and ask you, Mr. Coltrane, what kind of community conversations need to be placed, taking place and to make this successful in reaching the attainment goal? Absolutely. I think conversations are critical um, uh, to be able to reach the attainment goal. I think both at the state and the local level. Um, you know, the state level can help to, um, we can develop policies, we can come up with a shared vision and a shared agenda about what we need to do to move forward. But the work really happens at the local level. Um, it's schools and institutions of higher education that actually prepare students. Um, and so I think it's critical that um, uh, our local um, elected officials, our policymakers, our teachers, principals, superintendents, um, that they're really using data at the local level to see what are the barriers to um, students in my community, uh, and then what can we do to help um, make sure that more of our students are getting across the finish line with a degree or a career-ready credential. Ms. Goff, about 20 seconds, your final thought. Yeah. Just remember that we want data to know that we're serving our students and that we can use data to guide decision making and inform policy. And at the end of the day, I think that's the goal across all of Absolutely. these systems. That's great. Well, we've really uh, had the privilege of having you here today. Thank you so Thank very you. much for joining us. Thank you. After a brief commercial break, we'll be back to continue our discussion surrounding a statewide longitudinal data system with Dr. Jeff McDare, Superintendent of Transville County Schools, and Dr. Rebecca Tippett, Director of Carolina Demography. But first, see if you can answer this question. North Carolina is currently on track to produce 1.6 million graduates with a post-secondary credential or degree by 2030. But we need more credential workers to meet the workforce demands in 10 years. Can you guess how many more? Education Matters is brought to you each week in part by Town Bank, serving others enriching lives. Welcome back to Education Matters. Did you correctly answer D, 400,000? According to an assessment by the nonprofit organization My Future NC, by 2030, North Carolina will still fall short by at least 400,000 individuals with the skills needed to fill our state's projected job needs. Joining us now to talk about how to tackle this problem are Jeff McDerris, Superintendent of the Transylvania County Schools, and Dr. Rebecca Tippett, Director of Carolina Demography. Thank you both for joining us. Thank Glad you to be for here. having Thank us. Thank you. So, Dr. Tippett, let's open up. Carolina Demography has been working with uh, My Future NC to develop both statewide as well as county-specific profiles mm -hmm. uh, around uh, the county's level of attainment in terms of high-credentialed and um, post-secondary degreed mm -hmm. individuals uh, with an interest of making sure that we, as a state, are ready in 2030 to have 2 million 25 mm -hmm. to 44-year-olds that fall into that category of highly credentialed or uh, having a, earned a, a post-secondary degree. Bring us up to speed on how the attainment goal is working and the work that you are doing at Carolina Demography to support it. Yeah, so the attainment goal is a very concrete goal of 2 million by 2030, and it's specific to adults 25 to 44, and that is based on an estimate of both projected needs of, in the labor market as well as the size of that adult population in 2030. So we're accounting for all of those factors. And what we have been doing is My Future and See Commission and then the board approved of 18 educational performance indicators because to reach that goal, it's not just reaching the attainment goal. Attainment is an outcome of a process that occurs across the lifetime and impacts multiple sectors. So those 18 educational progress indicators are going to capture at the state level how the state is doing on benchmarks that indicate 
key things that need to happen to reach that goal. And then we have county profiles that we've developed that try to take those 18 progress indicators and push them down to the county level while providing additional demographic and institutional and labor market specific characteristics to the county so that county stakeholders can really help take that state goal and turn it into something that can be actionable at the local level. Very good. Dr. McDerris, I know that Transylvania is uh, one of the pioneers with Carolina demography and My Future NC, and you already have uh, your Transyl Transylvania County profile. Tell us a bit about what you're seeing in it that you're finding useful and how you think it can inform the work that you're doing within your school system and within your community um, partnerships. Well, one of the rules of, of data is uh, for us on the school side is that the, the more we know, the more we realize we didn't know. And we want this data. It's very important to us. We work very closely with our local community college, Blue Ridge Community College. They're a great partner. And when I look at technical attainment, dual enrollment numbers, and participation rates, and even things such as the FAFSA, uh, the data is helpful for me because this identifies some things that we we have the ability to adjust. We have the ability to, to dive into that piece and to try to work on a way to improve the, uh, the outcomes for our students. Right. Maybe talk a little bit about your community partnerships as you look at that piece and how that is playing out or beginning to play out. Well, I, I did mention Blue Ridge Community College. We also are very fortunate in my county to be a small rural county to also have a, a four-year college in our, in our county with Brevard College. And our community partners uh, are for us are, are the, the key to uh, not only student success, but also local economic development. Um, in a rural area, you know, they all go hand in hand. Uh, when economic development is improved, you're going to have the opportunity for businesses and industries to improve the, the job sector, which then brings or retains uh, families and, and, you know, fills up my schools, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. And so we have to work together on this. If you don't have those type of partnerships, and and they also offer some things that you would not normally have in place uh, with without them being there, such as the opportunity for students to take AP courses, higher level courses. Those are the types of things that are going to help us meet the need for the credentials down the road. Very good. So, Dr. Tippy, each county profile describes some opportunities for mm -hmm. improvement towards the attainment goals. Can you talk a little bit about how are these? unique to Transylvania versus mm -hmm. Hyde or versus Wake or Buncombe? So that's a great question. So the bottom part of the county profile is where we really try to make it actionable. And we've identified three high impact strategies for each community. And the way that we did that was first, we looked at indicators where counties might actually be able to move the needle. So FAFSA completion, um, post-secondary enrollment, completion rates, things where there actually may be strategies that can be implemented. And then we looked at them in comparison to their peer counties, which I need to have a definitional pause here because a peer county on this profile, we're using a definition from the rural center. So we are looking at urban counties, suburban counties, and then rural counties with and we're differentiating rural by metropolitan and non-metropolitan. So Transylvania is a rural, non-metro county. And we looked at how it's performing on the indicators that we were looking at in the county profile compared to the average of other rural, non-metropolitan counties. And the three areas where it was below average the most, those are its three high impact areas. Some counties, like Wake County, did not have three areas where they were below the peer average so we then compared to the state and on a few counties where they did not have they're still above average we looked at how they're going towards the goal okay. so we kind of are looking to peers so that counties feel as if they could then pull from other peer counties in similar situations to have possible lessons learned for how they're succeeding in an area that maybe they have an opportunity to move ahead in. So Dr. McDerris as you look at the the data that you um, currently are seeing before you, have you had thoughts about data that you don't have that you would think that you might like to have? Well, I think there's, uh, you know, uh, you have to start somewhere. And so this, this uh, data profile is a, is a great springboard to not only what, what can we do to help move the needle, but what other data could, could paint the full picture. And I've, you know, working closely with uh, the president of Blue, of Blue Ridge Community College, Laura Leatherwood, we look at a lot of different things in our community that affect the outcomes down the road, such as another data point that I would like to know is a comparison for my peer counties of, 
of even things like daycare, daycare accessibility, because you're not going to see the immediate effects. But imagine being a runner on a track uh, who is going to be competing against an elite runner, and that person gets a 20-yard head start. Daycare, pre-K education is incredibly important. And so those are just other data points that I think paint the fuller picture and let us all be able to work together with community partners, economic development, local county government on the different things that we can do to try to move the needle across the board. So Dr. Tippett, um, we've heard My Future NC, we've heard Carolina Dem Demography talk about these profiles are living documents. Mm -hmm. So talk about what you all are doing now to try to keep them living documents, to solicit feedback on mm -hmm. them and how is that going? Yeah, so we started, we're going to be releasing all 100 county profiles in late May or early June. And we started with a subset of profiles where we had key partners in those counties that they could give us very candid feedback on what was working and what wasn't. So Transylvania, as well as three other counties in the Land of Sky Collaborative, so Buncombe, Madison, and Henderson were available. We also were able to connect with some, um, some groups in Mecklenburg and New Hanover. So those are the six county profiles currently available and they have already had changes due to feedback. For example, we realized in the one that, the version that we released on February 10th, some of the data could have been communicated better, right. and so we've made improvements to that communication and clarified where it came from. And we also want right. to be fully transparent in right. that, so on the website, there's a version log that says these are the changes we made, this is why we did it. And yeah. on that same website, anybody from the public the school system, Excellent. et cetera, can give us direct feedback. It's fabulous. Uh, well, we've been uh, so fortunate to have you both on the show this evening. Thank you very much. After this break, this week's final word. Data is so important for helping us understand our current realities and future opportunities. For example, many North Carolinians intuitively know that we as a state could be doing better when it comes to ensuring that each of our children no matter their zip code, has equitable access to a system of strong, high-quality public schools. Now, thanks to a data-informed, court-ordered report that was recently released by independent, nonpartisan consultants at WestEd who studied the past few decades of trend lines for North Carolina school funding, we know why we aren't doing as well as we should be. First and foremost, data tells us we're not investing in our public schools overall as we should be. As of 2017, our state's per pupil spending ranking was the sixth lowest in the nation, and the, when adjusted to 2018 dollars, our per pupil spending has declined over the past decade by 6%. Data also tells us we haven't adequately invested in our teachers. The West Ed report found that budget cuts have reduced the total number of teachers employed in North Carolina by 5% from 2009 to 2018 even as student enrollment increased by 2%. This might not be much of a surprise if you consider teacher salaries and working conditions. After climbing for many years towards the national average, teacher compensation began falling here after 2008 and has lost significant ground despite some recent increases. Teachers also have very few opportunities for professional development and must rely on insufficient resources to do their jobs. Finally, data from the West Ed Report also tells us that we haven't invested in our most vulnerable children, despite the fact that we have a constitutional obligation to ensure that every North Carolina child has the right to access a sound basic education. We're now at a historic point in time. We have an opportunity to remedy this crisis thanks to a court order that demands education and state leaders work together to ensure each child in North Carolina receives a sound basic education. The responsibility now rests with each of us to be vigilant in holding our leaders accountable for complying with what the court says is our state's constitutional duty to each child. That's it for this week's show. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.